All right, Keith's tardy. <clears throat> Two of those you got to teach next quarter. Okay. Somewhere. Good evening, everybody. Let's offer a word of thanks. Dear Heavenly Father, we pause in our day and in our week. We're thankful for an opportunity to come together like this. That we can open up the Bible and search out the things you would have us to know. We pray for ever that we might increase in our knowledge. And in applying those things, the wisdom of, of using your word in our lives and to help others as we go from day to day. Father, we're mindful of those who may be sick or suffering. Those who are mourning loss of loved ones and dealing with that transition. Dealing with other issues and challenges that life throws at us from time to time. Help us to have the patience of the saints to wait upon you, even as we've read in many of these books that we're studying, uh, to continue looking upward to you for our guidance and for hope and for the faith. In Christ's name, amen. I ask you right off kind of an ancestral question. Did you have some ancestors whom you looked up to? Maybe it was your parents, your grandparents, aunts, uncles, others. You just thought a lot of, you know, really thought a lot of those people. Wanted to be like them, <clears throat> at least in a number of ways. And then what if somewhere along the line you found out they weren't quite as perfect or ideal as maybe maybe you had it in your mind. To come back into the setting of our study, the generally speaking, the Jews or the Israelites put a lot of stock in ancestry, didn't they? A lot of stock in tracing genealogy. You know, they would oftentimes conversations with Jesus or other times, they would go all of you know, Back to our father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you probably read in history how they were very adept at keeping records of that uh, down through the ages. That meant a lot to them. So what if you were part of that culture, these Jews, these Israelites, or now in our study, those who had lived in Judah, same culture. What if a prophet comes along and, and declares, don't be like your fathers, those who came before you. Chapter 1, as the book starts off, 1 sets the timeline, introduces us to this next prophet, Zechariah. Verse 2, the Lord has been sore displeased with your fathers. I mean, first words out of his mouth, he's jumping on my ancestry. Therefore say thou to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn you to me, says the Lord of hosts. I will turn to you, says the Lord of hosts. There's another of those repeating. When you got three times in one verse, maybe there's a reason he keeps repeating. Says the Lord of hosts, says the Lord of hosts, says the Lord of hosts. We talked about this a little bit last week. Here it is coming up again. But verse 4, then be not as your fathers. Those that you put so much stock in and they looked up to and, and traced all this down through, you know, whose lineage and which family, which branch and all that they were. Don't be like your fathers unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, what did he cry? Turn ye now from your evil ways, from your evil doings. But they did not hear, they did not hearken to me, says the Lord. So their immediate choice as Zechariah comes along. He's got 13 more chapters to go through, right? As we have it divided up. But their immediate choice from the word go was, listen to dad, listen to the Lord. And hear what's coming out in the message. Thus says the Lord of hosts. Thus says the Lord of hosts. Thus says the Lord of hosts. And he's going to hold it for them. What did your dad, your parents, those before you, what did your forefathers do? Verses 5 and 6, the wisdom and the lasting choice will be, listen to the Lord. Your fathers, verse 5, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? Just making a, an observation, none of us is going to last into perpetuity, no matter how good or ideal a person we were. 
we've seen from background that we've been looking to, many of them were not ideal or anywhere near perfect because of their wickednesses that God has sent prophets to lay out for them. Verse 6, but my words, the Lord, my words, my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? Where are your fathers? Oh, they're dead and gone in the past. Where's my word? It's still here. It's still alive. I sent it to the prophets before I'm sending you Haggai and Zechariah in your daytime, uh, in your life. Here's my word still going strong. They returned and said, what would their fathers have said? Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us, according to our ways, according to our doings, God had acted with justice and judgment. But what things God had said he was going to do, not just yesterday or 70 years ago, but we've been looking, he's been saying this for hundreds of years, sending prophet after prophet. So hath he dealt with us. So their choice is, you know, it's great to love your parents and grandparents and that aunt or uncle, whoever that went before you, you looked up to. But ultimately, we've got to look to God and to his word that does live and abide forever. That's what's going to keep going. And so he just kind of gets their attention right off the bat. Don't be like your fathers. I'm sore displeased with them and how they treated me and my prophets that I sent all these times. Quick review. We haven't looked at this timeline in quite a while. It's in the front of the workbook. It's been, what, about five months? You may have forgotten. But uh, you have been going along. Just think of all these prophets that we've covered now. And thank you for being here with me through this study. And we're quickly getting down to the end of it. But as the timeline goes, the United Kingdom, then it was split into Israel and Judah. Just very quickly, year 721 B.C., Israel, the northern tribes, were carried away into Assyrian bondage or captivity. Judah continued existing as a nation. Prophets still sent to them. Hey, you saw what just happened to your brethren up north to Israel? You're following the same path. Well, lo and behold, they listened for a little while. But then there's the series of carryings off or, you know, coming. Uh, um, ultimately, 586 carried away into Babylon. And so now Judah is gone. Guess what? A 70 year period coming along in here that... 536, we talked about last week, Zerubbabel, as the governor is going to be sent back and begin doing the work of rebuilding the temple. And uh, the people, remember, had built 16 years had elapsed since they went back. Uh, and so Haggai had come along first and said, hey, you better get busy. God says it's time to build. And now Zechariah, we see at the same time frame, uh, as will be brought on the workbook here, he starts his message just a couple of months after Haggai at least the things that are recorded that Haggai had spoken. So just trying to kind of lay that back into the setting of where we are. And in a few weeks, Lord willing, we'll look at Malachi, who's a little bit on down the road, but still in the post-exilic or after the exile period. The book of Zechariah. Man, a lot of this should be like review from last week's lesson. Yes, other than his name's going to have a different meaning. What did Haggai mean? Anybody remember? That was a whole week ago, Nolan. I mean, it was two long chapters. About what? Joyous? Joyous? Cause for joy? Yeah, exactly. Whereas Zechariah, whom the Lord remembers. First remnant, he, what this is saying, Zechariah was among the first remnant coming out of Babylon captivity when they got permission the king, go back and rebuild the temple, returning from Babylon, year 536 B.C. We noted there's a couple of verses back in Ezra where very clearly it says both of these, Haggai and Zechariah, were involved in motivating, preaching to, encouraging the people to get busy and complete the building of the temple that they had started. That's the whole reason you came back. And the king and all these others have sent money and funds and you know, gold and clothing and animals to, for sacrifice and all this. So just get busy and complete that work that needs to be done. The theme of both of these books could be summarized identically. Build the temple. You started it. You have sloughed off and stopped. So get back after it. We talked about the time frame again now for Zechariah. 520 to about 518. So 
There's a little bit more to what's recorded at least uh, for us. Haggai, Haggai, two short chapters, uh, 13 or so, 14 is it, with Zechariah. And he notes, we're not spending a lot of time in here, but maybe this word looks familiar from the Sunday morning study that Michael's doing in here out of the book of Revelation, that term apocalypse. So this one is written in an apocalyptic style. And again, if some of these words are big or, you know, 30 cent words or whatever, don't let that scare you off. He's talked about it in Revelation, what that means. It means the book is written with a lot of symbols in it, figurative language. You can't take everything exactly precisely it was intentionally written could that make sense here when we noted last week looking back into Ezra 1 through 6 that these Jews have come back from Babylon come back into the land the land wasn't just empty when they came back was it there were a few scragglers who had been left behind we were reminded last week but also the Babylonians the Assyrians others who went and captured conquered other nations they would take some from here and move them over here you know these cities that are kind of left behind somebody they would put somebody in there to live and dwell and and all this stuff and we talk about some of the trouble that's going to come as they started to rebuild the temple some of the locals now locals who live in the area would come up and say hey we're going to snitch on you to the king stop building trying to get them to stop or put them off in the work so we've got a, a message that's coming back to the jews Hey, get busy and build the temple again. When those around you are saying, no, don't do it. We're not going to let you. So here's this message that's going to be about rebuilding. It's going to be positive. It's going to be very encouraging, but written in some symbols and figuratively things for them to understand, to take heart and to jump back on the work. Uh, when those around are looking for any reason or excuse, you know, to send another letter to the king or snitch on them or get the work stopped and all that. So along with that, he, he suggests this book fits in. A grouping with Ezekiel, Daniel, and, and the book of Revelation, which are all similar, similarly written in this type of language. Zechariah is also a highly messianic type book. A lot of, of specific things, you know, not just a general statement, someday God's going to, you know, have a Savior, but more specifics even involved of what the Messiah would look like, his reign would look like. Uh, the lineage that he's going to come from, where it will be, just, you know, so he says similar to Isaiah, obviously a much longer book, but uh, for one of the minor prophets, Zechariah has a lot of stuff about the Messiah as well. So outline. Whew, we're not trying to tackle 14 chapters tonight. That's good. You know, I'll have enough trouble with four, right? But we've looked back a little bit at some of this stuff. Um, he calls us overall symbolic visions of exhortation and encouragement. So just thinking visions, night visions, a series of eight of these is going to happen where that uh, the word of the Lord of hosts is going to come to Zechariah at night. Uh, one of the times they say it's as if I was wakened out of bed and here's the vision. Here's the thing God wanted me to speak. So we've looked at uh, the introductory verses there. Let me turn my page catch up in my notes eight night visions and their interpretation you know i thought of this what would this be like we have in our day and time there's rumor of a big movie that's going to come out you know in the summer well it's only february what did they send us in february although the movie isn't going to pre uh, have its premiere till july 4th what would we have now a trailer, a preview, aren't we, right? Isn't that, in a sense, what God is saying through Zechariah? He's talking about things. Some of them are going to have an immediate you know, effect in their lives. But a lot of these things, talking about the messianic prophecies or aspect of, of Messiah, a lot of these things are going to be way down the road. Yeah, God's going to rebuild. You're, you're coming back into Judah and build the temple and be reestablished as a nation. But the ultimate, it talks about the spiritual kingdom to come. When the Messiah comes, the branch, the holy Jerusalem, all these kind of things that are going to be way down there. So in these visions, there's a little preview. There's a trailer. There's a sneak peek. Whatever term would help you, you know, kind of looking into this. And I just thought also, as I read through these, do I understand? Uh, no way do I understand 
You know, there's a lot of these verses you say, Nolan, what is chapter such and such, verse such? And I go, hey, you know, I don't know. But I'm going to suggest don't get bogged down in the details, especially if you're like me, you've never spent a lot of time reading and trying to dig into the minor prophets. At this point, if it's our first time through, uh, get the main point. Can you read through and get a, a feel? Again, symbolic, figurative language. Can you get a feel or the main point? And I like how in the workbook, that's the first thing he tells us, first paragraph under each of these visions. He's going to say, here's what the main point, what this thing is about. Whether I can understand what every tree and color of horse and you know how many people are there, whatever. Okay, I can get a sense of the idea here. And so this first one, the rider and the horseman among the myrtle trees, chapter 1. The point, he says, of this first one is to assure them the temple is going to be rebuilt. And I've selected a few verses out of each of these, see how we can do getting to at least a taste for each of these. In chapter 1, verse 7, for example, here's how these visions will start. <clears throat> He'll tell us on what day of the month, 4 and 20th day, the 11th month, it's the month Sebat, second year of Darius. Come the word of the Lord to Zechariah, who's the son of Berechiah, son of Iddo, the prophet, saying, here's the first one, I saw by night. There's a man riding a red horse. He stands among the myrtle trees that are in the bottom. Behind him there's red horses and speckled and white, different colors. And I said to my Lord, what are these things? I mean, if the prophet right then is having to ask, what does some of this mean? And help me out with the explanation of it. Yeah, Nolan lived in the United States, you know, 2,000 years later. There might be some things don't just jump right out at me either. And he does this throughout. What is this? And the guy will talk in this part of it. Well, you know what the next part means? No, I don't know what that is either. Tell me. He just keeps asking. So here, the angel that talks says, I'm going to show you what these be. The man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro through the earth. So on these different color, reddish brown, speckled, or you know, white horses and all this, there's a sense the earth is quiet and peaceful at this time. As these messengers going through throughout the earth. And that's what they're finding. Uh, verse 12. And picking up again. The angel says. Lord of hosts. How long wilt thou not have mercy? Have we heard a question like this? Just like a week or so ago. Lord. How long till you're going to do something? You know. <clears throat> my timeline. What I'm thinking. You should have already acted. And made this right. <clears throat> we talked about avengement. <clears throat> in that previous lesson. And I was. Kind of neat to see that word in the difference of revenge versus avenge. As in Revelation also, we've seen that. But here they are asking, you know, uh, how long uh, that you're going to have mercy in Jerusalem, on the city of Judah, which you, against which you've had indignation these three score and ten years? Do you kind of, in, in him asking the question, how long is three score and ten years? Seventy? Okay, I can do that much math. Kind of in asking the question... Should they already have known the answer? Weren't the prophecies, when you're carried off into captivity, Judah, it's going to last for a period of 70 years. But here's somebody, you know, look, it's been 70 years. When are you going to do something about this? Oh, the Lord is doing something about this. The Lord answers, verse 13, the angel that talked with me, good words, comfortable words. And, and the angel of the commune says, Cry, thus says the Lord of hosts, I'm jealous for Jerusalem, for Zion with a great jealousy. I was sore, I'm was i very sore to displeased with the heathen that are at ease, etc., uh, etc. Et and he talks about in the workbook how the Lord, he's raising up nations to do, you know, do works for him. On this occasion, these other nations he raised up have gone too far, carried it too far, not just to defeat this nation and put them in captivity you know, for seven years or whatever. But they just kept going in their cruelty and, and treatment of people and all that. And so the Lord now started the chapter. I was displeased with your fathers who wouldn't turn back to me and listen to my word. But now these nations that I gave a command to go so far and do this, they've overstepped their bounds. So now the Lord is very displeased with them. And so 16, I'm returned to Jerusalem with mercies. You're asking, when am I going to have? That's what I'm doing. As the prophet said, you know, maybe if you'd listened to those prophets years ago, or your fathers listened, you would have known the answer to this. That is exactly what I'm doing. My house is going to be built in it. 
My line will be stretched forth in Jerusalem. 17. My cities uh, through prosperity will be spread abroad. The Lord shall set comfort, uh, shall yet comfort Zion and shall yet choose Jerusalem. So still in God's favor, it's, it's happened as he said by the prophet, the timeline that he had set, and now he's, the 70 years are passed. He's sending the people back, you know, by using a king who gave them authority and, and all the supplies, everything they need to come back and rebuild the temple. Second one, another vision. There's a vision about four horns and four carpenters. Well, goodness, I, you know, if I just read that one sentence, I would be guessing also. What does that mean? But we've got the hint of the author in the book that tells us that's suggesting the enemy powers that are going to be cast down. And when you read through here, as he sees, here's what he sees for, what are these? I don't get it. Well, the four horns are those powers that have been mistreating Judah and these other nations. That have been raised up. They've been the stronger nations for a time, for a purpose. And so they've been coming through and, you know, destroying your cities and carrying off your stuff, you know, as loot and everything. But that's coming to an end. Because the second half of it, there are these craftsmen. Well, that's the whole idea. If you hear if somebody's a craftsman, they do what kind of things? They've got some skills or talents to build to make something and that's the second half of this vision yeah these powers have been sent in they've done their job god said that i sent them to do but now i'm going to send somebody that's going to quell that calm them down and this took me back again going to last week's study since haggai and Zechariah are pretty much overlapping kind of can think of them together and remember we went back quickly to Ezariah chapters like four five and six those that were their enemies are, you know, getting the work stopped by whatever means, right? So much so that in Haggai's message, remember the Lord started off saying, the people say it is not time to build. Well, our enemies are against us. Everything we try, they're, you know, they're like throwing up the red tape. We would say there's a regulation or run back to the king who says, stop, don't do it. And, you know, all this that they're fighting. They're saying it's not time to build. God sends the second message. To me, it's just in answer to that whole situation. What's going on? Yep, the powers have been here. But I'm squelching them. Putting them down. It is time to build. They're not going to be a, you know, be able to stop anymore. They may be a thorn in your side. They may complain or you know, do the little tricks they're trying to do to get you to stop. But they're not going to stop anymore. It's time to build because the hostilities are over. God's saying the carpenters, the smiths, these craftsmen, it's time. Don't be hindered anymore. It's time to build. And God's going to see to any you know, interference or whatever's going to try to come up uh, from here on. There's more of these. Number three, there's a man with a measuring line. Chapter two. What do you see, Zechariah? Well, here's, here's the vision I saw. A guy with a measuring line. He's headed towards Jerusalem. Why are you going to Jerusalem? What are you going to do there? I'm going to measure. It's length and it's breadth. How big is the city? But some of the language that comes out of this one. Where are we now? Chapter 2. Um, so verse 1, I lifted my eyes. Here's the man with the measuring line. Where are you going? Verse 2, to measure Jerusalem. What's its breadth? What's its length? The angel that talked with me goes forth and another angel is out to meet him. And he says, run, speak to this young man saying, Jerusalem's going to be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. Does that suggest famine and without that we've been reading about as they've been punished by God? Abundance now, right, is the picture. We've got to see how big Jerusalem is, how much it can hold because there's going to be multitudes of people and animals therein. For I, says the Lord, will be to her a wall of fire round about. I will be the glory in the midst of her. Verse 6 now, message to the people, to these Jews. You know, come forth, flee from the land of the north. What was up north? That was Babylon. Assyria, up in that area where they had been carried off. So get out of there. I've spread your broad as the four uh, winds of the heaven. And deliver yourself, and etc., etc., down through here. 
Oh, let me drop on down then, verse 10. Sing and rejoice, daughters of Zion. Lo, I'm coming. This is God speaking. I will dwell in the midst of thee, says the Lord. Many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day and shall be my people. Remember that phrase, and it comes up a number of times in this book again, that we've been seeing from earlier prophecies, the use of that phrase, in that day, in the day, looking not just to the end of the seven-year period. Yeah, God's bringing them back in the land, but again, looking down the road to the time of the Messiah, in that day, when God's kingdom will be established, many nations shall flow into it. You think of those verses in Isaiah, or perhaps some of the other prophecies. But here's what he's saying here. Many nations are going to be joined and be involved in this. Beautiful language. Great pictures. Great, great visions. Anything through the first three. Well, let's look at another picture. What's well, number four? Oh, there's this trial and acquittal of the high priest whose name was Joshua throughout chapter three. Main point, what is this? We need to see the a cleansing of the priesthood to bringing back not only the priest, but it says representative of all the people, bringing them back to God. And so here's this vision there. And, and we've got the presence of Satan who's standing over you kind of on the sideline going, you know, this priest, this guy, or the people, any of them could point at any of them. They haven't listened to God. They've been doing wrong. They've been doing these sins that you have enumerated from previous prophets, prophets that have been sent to them. So they're not clean. And the prophets, uh, the priest, you know, this guy, he can't come in your temple and serve and do these sacrifices and offerings and you know, all that because you know, Satan's always had intelligence and knowledge, right, to know what the Word of God teaches. It doesn't mean he follows it. He would have knowledge and awareness of it. So what is God doing in this vision? There's Joshua standing with some filthy garments. Where are we here? Chapter 3. Let me find my place. Verse 3. Joshua's clothed with filthy garments. He stood for the angel. He, God answers and spake to those that stood for him, saying, You take away the filthy garments from him. And behold, I've caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. So he's changing them out. He's cleansing the priests and the priesthood. And he said... Uh, as representative, he's doing this for all of his people. He sent them away into his captivity. They've done their time. They've been punished justly, as God had said, for as long as he said, that time is up. I'm bringing them back. New change of clothes. Everything's clean. We're starting over as we're starting afresh, starting clean, however you want to say that. And uh, they're ready to serve now. In verse 7, the charge that God says, and you could go back, what, in the book of Deuteronomy? Joshua, go back to any number of places and you find almost word for word, God having said this before, right? Here he is, we're starting over after the captivity. I'm putting you back in the land. Temple's going to be rebuilt. If you will walk in my ways, if you'll keep my charge, then you can judge my house. You'll keep my courts. I'll give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Well, that's nothing new God is saying. He's told the Israelites this X number of times throughout the ages. Under different leaders, times of judges, in the times of the kings, just over and over. But here we are back, my ways, and keep my charge. Don't be like your fathers. I tried to get them to turn and come back to my ways, they refused. You don't be like them. Keep my ways and my charge. And, and you know, there'd be blessings and it would work for them. All right? Oh, and then what's next? The golden candlestick, chapter four, and the two olive trees. What is this one going to be all about? God's going to enable the completion of the temple rebuild. Again, they had started it, but it's been 16 years and they've kind of got the foundation laid, but no more work's going on. God's got the vision to give to Zechariah of the thing being completed and that who's going to do it. And how it's going to happen throughout chapter 4. Uh, verse 2. Here's what he saw. What do you see? Well, I look and there's a candlestick of gold and this bowl. You know, we say a pitcher, something that holds you know, a liquid on the top of it. There's seven lamps there on. And there's these seven pipes 
that are going to carry this oil flow to the seven lamps. And they're on the top of it. And there's two olive trees by it. One on the right side. The other on the left side. So I answer and speak to the angel that talks to me. Saying, what are these? I mean, that's Zechariah. Not getting it. Asking. The angel that talks with him is going to 200, uh, verse 5. You don't know what these are? No, my Lord. Verse 6. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. How is this temple going to be completed? It's not because you have the biggest army to, you know, ward off. I mean, you're a little bitty remnant just coming back out of captivity with nothing in essence other than what they could carry or the king is sent to build with. That's not how it's going to be done. But by spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Drop down to verse 9. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation. In other words, he started this work as he was supposed to. His hands shall also finish it. You'll know the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Can you imagine 16 years of project just laying, you know, not half finished, one hundredth finished, whatever it would be. But he's saying, no, the same guy that started it, he's going to see it through to the end. So he's given them this, this preview that said, it is going to happen. It's not going to be you're going to die and maybe down the road somebody else comes along. No. The people and the things you need are here. You're going to do this. Verse 10, this question he asks, Who hath despised the day of small things? They're going to rejoice, see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven, the eyes of the Lord that run to and fro through the whole earth. Remember, wow, here we go. Review what minor prophet did we talk about that had, he had a vision about a plumb line. You remember who that was? I know Joe knows. He's got all this stuff down. I'm trying to learn it. Is it the one that starts with an A? Have I got the right one, Joe? Sure. Will you give me Amos with the plumb line? You're going to see this guy with that plumb line. The string with the weight on it. Either a rock or a stone or something. You're going to see him there out there doing the work. Measuring, checking. Did we get it right? Is everything being built? That's what you're going to see God saying. That's God's knowledge, vision he's giving now through these angels, these messengers to Zechariah. That he can tell the people, including Zerubbabel, the guy in charge, you started it, you're going to finish it. Now, for those that despise the day of small things, who, you know, you did this much work, 16 years, we haven't done anything else, this is never going to happen, right? They're just kind of sneering or mocking or making fun of or whatever. This is God's answer. Don't despise, don't mock, you know, because it's going to be complete. What I said is going to happen is the point of this one. And just keeps describing through here, you know, at the end of it, okay, that's what the lamps and the oil and all that's about. How about these two stand on either side? That's the two anointed offices God has set in place at this time, right? Zerubbabel, the governor, kind of the political leader, if you will, as he talks about, and Joshua, the high priest, spiritual leader. They're hand in hand. They're right there seeing that this thing gets done. And it will get done. And that's the point of this vision. Even if I don't know all the every common, you know, what all the other stuff means. Temple's going to be completed is the point. So get after it. Get after it. Get after it. Again, all that, you know, they're looking at building this building. That needed to happen right then. But so much underlying, as you, if you take the time and read carefully in these chapters, you get the sense of times he's talking about something down the road. In that day, the branch, the holy city, uh, all nations being part of it, right? Are times that were not an immediate uh, fulfillment of the prophecy, but looking down the road. So I hope you can see that and do, you may have to go back and read it a second time. A fifth time to dig and pull some of these things out. I encourage you to do that. Some of the applications. Once he lists on page 107. From chapter 1 verse 5. The frailty of flesh of men. We live and die. God's word endures forever. Peter reminds us. And whether men accept or reject God, God's word. Will not alter its effectiveness. I really like that sentence. Kind of jumped out at me. We may not do it. I may choose not to do it. 
That doesn't change God's word, his plan, his will. It's still going to come to pass. The commandments are still good. Even if I don't, just like for them, even if your fathers refused to listen and did not turn back to me, God's still going to keep working. His plan will come to pass. Second one there, chapter 4. Too often men rely solely on human wisdom and strength to determine what they can or cannot do. With the Lord's work, we must recognize God is our source of strength. He can enable us to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Ephesians chapter 3. And he can take what may seem small in our eyes and multiply it many times over. Don't despise the small things. You know, the greatest work has to start somewhere with the found, moving the dirt or the foundation or whatever you know, comes first. I'm not the guy to ask about building things. And what I added here, chapter 2, verse 13. Did you read this? Did that sound familiar at all when you read in Zechariah chapter 2, verse 13? Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord. He is raised up out of His holy habitation. Have you heard a verse like that? Maybe somewhere else, maybe this quarter in maybe another of the minor prophets. Who was that? You can look at your center reference or wherever it tells you. Check here and go back to the book of Habakkuk. Was it chapter 2, verse 20? It's not word for word, but it's that same thought, isn't it? Back then we talked about it. The idea is, rise up against God, I can be proud and I don't need Him, don't have to listen to Him. Or the point of the verse in Habakkuk, and I think the same point here, humility when the Lord speaks, we need to stop and listen. Not questioning it, not mocking it, not making fun of it, not saying that's not how I would do it, not saying, well, you're way late, and you should have acted on this a long time ago, or whatever. But be still, be quiet. God's coming, we're reminded, out of heaven, His holy habitation. We need to be silent and listen when God is speaking, when He's acting, you know, whatever He's going to do. Bunch of great questions in the book. I hope you got to those. Give me a quick thought on he asked about these other places where the branch, Christ is referred to as the branch. Why is that in this Isaiah 4 and chapter 11 and Jeremiah 23 and 33 and, and later even in this same book, chapter 6? What is that speaking to? Okay, exactly. He's going to go back to a source or origin, isn't he? Tying him back in with David. So here comes a branch. Out of that root, a branch down the line. So it can speak to lineage, speaks to source, all these things. It's cool, some of the language. If you read, go, oh, yeah, you got to turn to other books and read other chapters. But talk about him growing up out of his place, building the temple, sitting and ruling on his throne. All these uh, just great imagery that fits in with the name, so to speak, or the description, Jesus or the Messiah would be the branch. How about that last one? The Bible speaking of the church is Jerusalem. Hebrews 12, Galatians 4, uh, Revelation 21. What's the connection there? What's the thought? Why is it designated as Jerusalem? Well, obviously, Nolan, there's the contrast of Israel coming to Mount Sinai way back there in the desert time. God's going to give them a set of laws where they become a nation. But God is, is their you know, leader and the king. Here's the laws, and now they've got a people for you know, the king to be over. Hebrews 12 talks about you're the saints, here's Christians in the New Testament, coming to spiritual Zion or Jerusalem. Refuse not him who speaks. Like back there, they were so scared at Mount Sinai, quaking, trembling earthquake and lightning and all that. When God speaks now, a better law, the new covenant, don't refuse him that speaks. Like the fathers had done, the Zachariah is saying, your fathers wouldn't listen when I spoke to you. Man, that's so much good stuff. Thank you. Oh, what does that leave us next week? Lesson 24. We're staying Zachariah. Keep chopping it up. Just four more chapters, five, six, seven, and eight for next week. Thank you, thank you.